So we are going to tell you about interpretable probabilistic models for code. So that's that's a bit different uh, or slightly orthogonal topic to the topics that were discussed so far. So what what I'm going to tell you about is actually learning from code using code as training data. Uh, so and this is the real code, not synthetic examples. And the goal is that we actually automate software processes on this code. And big code is a good research enabler, so there is growing amount of training data, so it should be, you should care about it. And there is a lot to be learned from this data, but it's a bit trickier to learn from it. And it actually requires new kind of models that uh, will certainly also help in the program synthesis. So we have done a bunch of tools in this area, uh, most of them academic, so tools that will do, write new code, like do code completion as you're typing, they will tell you what you, what you most likely type next. Port code right from one programming language to another, like Google Translate for programming languages. A couple of people are working on this topic now. Understanding code and security, predicting variable names, uh, or predicting types of obfuscated code. And most recently, finding issues in, uh, in programs. So this is, if bugs were already fixed in some programs, why would you not just transfer these fix fixes from one place to another? And there are two main data sets there that I want to mention. So the first one is the code, and you can learn a lot of things about the code, but think of like what kind of questions you can ask. So let's say, think of this as something like Python, and then you say f equal open, and I don't care what's in open, then you have f dot write, and the question is, what is usually done after that? What do you do uh, when you write code after that? And this is immediate application, I can do code completion, for example. But here are, here are the answers uh, that, that we have in a recent model. With f, you would either do f.close, most likely you would do probably more right, or you would do flush with different probabilities. And that's naturally a model for code. You can think of it as n-gram model. You can do neural, net, neural models based on this kind of traces over f. Uh, but there is a challenge here, which is to understand code. So this is what I showed you before as abstraction, but this is actually how code in GitHub looks like. So with open, so you have to understand what me, with means, and then there is actually really right on this, and then there are some other loops and tiffs, things that mostly don't matter actually for this qu question. What does happen after the first write, and there is another write happening. The challenge can be even more serious because they think above is not very readable for human, and below is more readable for human. Because what happens is there is a call to other function write partitions, which I didn't, I didn't include in this sample, but it actually does what, what the loop before was doing. So you have to understand also interprocedurally what happens in order to be able to answer such kind of questions. There is another data set I want to mention that's very interesting and we explored it recently, which is the changes. And so here is an example of two hash functions that people commonly use. Uh, they're cryptographically secure, but SHA-1 is now considered not so secure after recent uh, discovery of collisions in SHA-1. So this is the number of usages we have in our model. Uh, so that's what we have in deep code after collecting a lot of GitHub repositories. Uh, so which, which one are we going to recommend? One has 1,900 usages, the other one has 1,142. And that's actually a hard question to answer because there is a related report about using cryptographic APIs which says that 88% of the Android applications are doing something wrong. Well, there is kind of very interesting information in these commits and it's that many more people are switching from SHA-1 to SHA-256 than the other way around. So there is a new challenge here, however, that as you saw before, there are like 2,000 usages and things to learn from and now there are probably 40, 50 things to learn from. So we have to be much more sensitive. And that's why program synthesis is good. And there is the other challenge here as well, as it happens in, uh, in, in if you look at code only, not only from on changes. You see, you see people are changing some lines of code in the program. But these lines of code, like syntactically changing a line doesn't mean that there is anything semantic. So this, this is a real commit. And you will notice that it's actually a knob, basically, with respect to this API. It just extracts the expression into a variable. And people do these, these things 
a lot when they do other refactoring. So one commit, you usually have like a couple of these plus something semantic. So we should be able to distinguish between them. So I want to tell you about two main learning tasks. One is to learn to predict code, and the other learn to predict changes, which roughly corresponds to these two data sets. And in learning to predict code, uh, we'll see what kind of uh, training procedure we need to do to, to get to good models. So let's, let's look at some other data set. It's similar to the open, like to the Python open API, just make some other toy API. Think of it as like socket or something, and you open something and then you read and write. Then you have training data, you have query, and the training data says that you open, then read, or open, write. And now you are at your query, and then you have to say, uh, what should be there at this position? And before neural networks, we can actually train much more simpler model, which, is, which existed for many years ago, which is, let's look at probabilistic model on the engrams, on tokens. So it will, it will learn something like that if you have C dot with three sixths or one half probability, you would call open. And that's probably not very good, but it, it's still nevertheless a baseline model to consider. So this kind of baseline model would predict open in this case, but maybe there are many other cases where it would predict the right thing. For example, maybe in the parameter of open, it would predict it right because it would condition on open. So this would work in some cases. Well, we did some more advanced model that understands the code, so it does much more advanced program analysis, and now it knows that C is a variable and knows to go to previous locations of the same variable, and so I can say, if I have read, I can condition actually on the previous API I caught on the same object. And then if I have such kind of query with this different context, now not, not the tokens that followed the place I want to complete the question mark in the query, but based on the open before in the query, I can say, well, most likely I will do read or write. So there are different contexts that can be learned and manually providing this context is hard, and so the question is, can we actually do machine learning for them? Can we learn them in some way? So by, for example, combining in some cases using one context, in other cases another context, or in general, better context than what we could find so far. And for this, we suggest to use program synthesis, and the whole idea is that we will synthesize a short program, and this short program will be the model that we will have. Uh, so this. This will use synthesize function f that will take code, and based on the code, it will select what positions in the code actually matter for the prediction. What position should we look at to make such kind of predictions? And this program synthesis in its almost most classic variant. So we want to learn short programs for a couple of examples. Well, the number of examples is large, but the programs are short, so we can actually use techniques from program synthesis. We don't need to do some uh, differentiable magic, we can just use the techniques from program synthesis. So what we have now is we have representation, which for example would be abstract syntax trees of programs. We will make this domain-specific language which will move over programs. We will synthesize the best program in this domain-specific language, and then after that we will use this best program to compute context and get the best model. So the representation is lo looks like an AST, so I give an example with JavaScript which has more like syntactic kind of uh, AST, so they look like you call some method, you, it's relatively difficult to do analysis, but some analysis can be done. You often use JSON objects and some very complicated uh, uh, APIs. So we pick this kind of representation and then we will make predictions for, this, for the program here. So now we will define the abstract uh, well, once we have the abstract syntax tree, we have to define domain-specific language that moves over these trees. And here we were picking the components in such a way that essentially they, they can possibly define pro code analysis. So that's, that's a bit different than the approach that is usually done with, say, neural networks, where you say neural network can express anything, or neural network can, or neuro Turing machine can possibly express any computation, but it's so general that it almost never converges to anything realistic. So we're now picking a domain-specific language and we know exactly its expressibility. Uh, and in this case, we are picking instructions. So for example, there is pre known context, which is instruction that would look for previous usage of the variable. 
for example. So based on this kind of instructions, we can actually build uh, the models that I described before, and we can actually find if this is the best model and if we can possibly synthesize even better model. So we do the synthesis, so it's actually quite involved. There are a few things to do. So the first thing is there is noise in the data, should be able to handle noise. Then we actually can build probabilistic model out of what we have. And finally, our domain-specific language also has, has e statements, so we can actually use combination of decision tree learning and other uh, synthesis techniques. So we can actually generate uh, programs that also have if statements automatically. So what's the nice thing of this? Well, the nice thing of making this kind of synthesis is that now my output is completely interpretable. And it's actually very nice property to have, especially for programs, because you want to motivate to people why some, some prediction was made. So here is an example. We have the query element.notify, and we have to predict the last property that will be passed in the JSON object as the third argument of element.notify. Well, if you look at this program, it moves over the AST, actually left on the AST is actually the up statement, the, the statement on the previous line uh, that you see in the code. But what it actually does is it moves over the AST and visits the blue nodes that I show in the code. And if you look, what it does is it actually conditions, so it, it puts in the context height, tree, and notify. So this is the previous property, the number of the argument that we are completing, and the API name that we are completing. So that's that's much, much better than if we would just say something that uh, there were some weights on some network. So maybe the closest to this is the, the attention mechanism where you can point where the attention, uh, what, the, what the attention found, except that it's even more interpretable. It's not, not just on the example, but I can generally say as a program what we do. So the system does as follows. So we have training data. We have two steps. So the first is synthesis. And then we learn the model that actually just counts how many times we had prediction given a context. We have this system finally generated on the whole training data, and then we evaluate it on separate data that's actually public, and there are a bunch of papers already that try to improve on our results. So here is what we got. The synthesis does much better than if we do this, these things manually, if we manually say condition on the last two tokens, on the last two APIs. So it does much better than this. We can actually apply the same technique to natural language processing. So this is, uh, instead of making domain-specific language for programs, we do it for text. So we can, in the same way as we traverse the ASTs, traverse text, and actually do the same kind of uh, prediction. Again, DSL conditions the model. It's interpretable. And in the end, the final step is counting how, how many times we had G as completion in some context this example. And it does reasonably well. It does as well as, about as well as generic LSTM. There are, of course, better models. But it depends on the task. So some tasks are more structured, and they would, it would help more to actually get interpretable results. And you would get also higher precision by having it interpretable. And others are more fuzzy. So you would rather, you would rather want to have something that averages across multiple things that are mildly interpretable. So that's, that's how this kind of synthesis technique goes against neural networks on a bunch of tasks. So the nice thing is what we have done for JavaScript AST is with public, uh, public data set. And very recently in DHKI, there is a paper that uses mixture model of pointer networks and, um, and LSTMs. So that gets to 81% on this task, which is still not quite where the synthesis gets to. So there is still more to be done. I, I don't know at what point the neural network will do better than the synthesis, but we can actually improve the synthesis as well. We have some even higher results that are unpublished. So on program text and comments, uh, the most recent work I found is LSTM. And we still do better on this, because program text and comments as, as characters is quite much more structured than English language. On Wikipedia, though, there are very advanced models that do better than what we do. So we, they don't report error rate. They report entropy. But we, also, we could also compute entropy to get similar metrics. So this kind of model is 
very different, much more interpretable neural network, and actually can directly compete with neural network on some tasks. Uh, so it's, it's a good thing to, to explore, and we are actually exploring it also in other cases. I want to tell you about uh, what we did most recently, which is about predicting what changes you will do in the code, and that's actually quite a software engineering task. So, about predicting changes. So, here is an example about crypto. So, before I showed you SHA-1 to SHA-256, that's another, that's another crypto example where somebody is switching from one crypto function to another. And we have something in the training data. The training data looks like this. There are commits, and somebody changes from the code that you see on the left to the code you see on the right. We have to understand what these changes, as you can see syntactically, it's much larger. Maybe you can see some tokens appearing, some tokens disappearing. But overall, if we do, if we do our program analysis, and we actually look at the semantics of this. And for example, we need to fold constants. So this string algorithm that says AES, we would fold it directly to get instance. So we would know that get instance gets this constant in. Uh, so if we do this, we can get this tree-like representation that now captures much more what's happening in this commit. It's much more semantic. We know what is being changed here. So based on a, a lot of these commits, but already analyzed, we can actually obtain rules. And this we can do with program synthesis. We can have a rule that we can actually explain to the user now. Explainability now is important. We basically want to tell the user, well, don't use only AES, which is, turns out to be AES ECB, um, the default mode. Use AES CBC. So here is how we go. So the first important step just like in the previous case, but then it was less visible, we just hidden it in the DSL, was to analyze every, every version of the training data. So this is, we would know what are the location sites. So for example, we would know that ENC is a cipher that we get with get instance, and then the same ENC is used after that in init. Then for this object that, that we obtain by cipher.get instance, we would know the APIs we would call get instance and init, and they are on the same object. Uh, then we would also track the parameters. We would figure out that algorithm is actually AES, and then we would know what we pass to the init method. So now that's our training data. And we would do such kind of graphs for every, uh, for every object that we have. So that's for Cypher. We would get such kind of graph. And we would do this with every version. So in the other case, we would get this kind of knock. And so now we have the commits. And from these commits, we are going to get to features. And you can look now, it's much, first, much, much fewer things have changed. Now I can say AES was removed, AES, CBC, PKC, five, five padding was added, and IV parameter spec was added as well. So we can get these kind of features now from the commit. And here is what we actually want as output. So we can, we can almost stop here, we can get these such kind of features and group them and look at them manually. And especially for security kind of suggestions, better look manually. But here is what we are going to get in the end. Uh, we're going to get things like use one cipher instead of another, use secure random in, in, instance, in, initialize it with some parameter, do not use password-based encryption with static salt. So these are very, very semantic things. And that's what, that's what the users want. They want to find bugs in their programs and they want to fix these bugs. So that's, that's, that's the explanation that they would get to. So based on this, our last step is actually synthesis of rules. So we look at what has changed, and we try to find a rule that, that we will figure out what, what, what matters for this change so that we can group a, group a bunch of commits into one rule. And in the end, this rule is explainable. I can tell you why, why I triggered the rule. I can tell you based on what AST node it was done. And then I can also say which commits exactly included the rule. And so these are the challenges. We want to explain predictions. And more importantly now, what we are working on is we want to motivate predictions. So this is combining with, with NLP. And that's what we do actually at deep code now most of the time. So we look at commits and we find such kind of rules. So this is an example of rule that was fixed by 80 projects. And it says, 
if you use in Android find view by ID, that's probably not the best way to do it. There are libraries which will essentially make it more, uh, which, you, which you wrap this behavior into uh, attributes, into fields, and you just don't have to write this code at all. So you just say butter knife bind. And so here is how it looks in commits. So I can say, well, look at this commit in on create view instead of inflate, instead of making uh, variables and finding them by ID, you just say butter knife dot bind, and then everything will work. And we can see the explanations by others. It just says uh, added butter knife, updated fragments, added support for butter knife. So you can see it somehow motivates the thing, although it doesn't really say what was the issue with the code before. So with this, uh, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left. Uh, is it the case that you use like MCMC or like genetic programming to synthesize these rules? Or how, how is the search done? Yes, so it's Marco, Marco Chain Monte Carlo search. So it starts with, it, it does greedy steps by trying to add more things to the program and occasionally it, it worsens, the, worsens it. How, how hard was it to get it to converge? I mean, I'm curious. It's actually not very hard because I don't think that the problem is very complicated. So this kind of optimization problem is very complicated. The reason I think so is that all those, there are commits that do multiple things at the same time. There are also many commits that do only one thing. So they would actually help the search quite a lot. Okay, thanks.